Hello and welcome to Sparda Lines, your one-stop destination for the civil services examination preparation, UPSC, KPSC and other relevant examinations. Today, we will pick up some of the important topics that are in use with respect to GS Paper 1, GS Paper 2, GS Paper 3 and also from ethics perspective as well, where we have one of the articles which deals with artificial intelligence and ethical perspective. We will try and understand all these important articles. First up, let us congratulate all of us. India is proud of ISRO. We are all proud of ISRO and what we have to do is congratulate ISRO on this very premise where we have had a soft landing on the southern pole of moon. This happens to be a very very important event. So let us congratulate ISRO and let us congratulate ourselves and India for this historical moment. This happens to be a very important topic from your GS paper 3 issue. What we will try and do is come up with an independent analysis for this entire topic. Let us not take this topic as part of our news analysis. What we will try and come up with with an independent video where we will explain you all the nitty gritties of this particular topic. What is the importance? Why it is important? And how it is going to bring a greater prosperity to India? Literally, we will understand everything about Chandrayaan 3 in an independent video. But all that I can seek now is we have to congratulate ISRO for this achievement. When India was independent after 1947 and subsequently after many years as well, we were called as the snake charmers. Why were we called as snake charmers? That is because many countries believe that when foreign dignitaries, foreign ambassadors, foreign representatives came to India, snake charmers were called in and they were given the entertainment. That is the foreign dignitaries were given the entertainment in the form of snake charmers showing how we would be able to control the snake so on and so forth. But now we have achieved a state where even the western powers are not able to do. We are the first country in the entire planet where we are able to reach the southern pole of the moon as well. That has been the achievement of India. From a country which was known for its poverty after independence, now we are the country known for science and technology. A movie is going to take a funding of 600 crores and within the same budget, ISRO has been able to achieve an exceptional feat. So it is time for us to congratulate ISRO. It is time for us to congratulate the brains behind ISRO as well. Another lesson that we can also learn is, I remember the words of Sudha Murthy Amma, who happens to be the wife of Narayan Murthy Infosys. So what she says is, she gives us an explanation about modernity as well as civility and the culture. She goes on to explain that when it comes to achievement, what dresses that you wear, what costumes you wear does not matter. When you look at ISRO videos, when you look at people congratulating each other, when you look at women who wear saris, that also shows that our culture also comes up, that we have to be grounded, we have to put out our culture as well, we have to respect our culture as well. So it is not about what dress you wear, it is about how well you carry it. So even a woman with saris where in couple of places in Delhi, if you're keen observer of what is happening in and around country, there were hotels which did not allow women coming up in saris because they felt that saris are not modern. And today, what these women in Israel have also been able to prove is that it is not about modernity per se, it is about the knowledge and the intellectual capacity. So we learn a lot of lessons from these as well. So respect the country, respect the culture, respect the knowledge, respect the intellectual capacity is what we have to understand with these as well. So the point to be understood is, it's a greatest feat that we have achieved. India is one of the first countries to reach the South Pole of the Moon. So we have to congratulate India is what is this article all about. So basically we will come up with a detailed analysis for this entire concept. Until that, please stay tuned. Now let's look into another article which speaks about the social security schemes.
This article is important from your GS paper 3 economics as well as from the GS paper 2 social justice as well. So the article is speaking about the social security schemes and programs that has to be revamped is what the author is trying to come up with an idea. So what is the social security scheme? As the very name denotes, it speaks about security that needs to be provided to the individuals. Security when? Security is to be provided when an individual reaches the ages of retirement so let's say i have the strength right now i would be able to work right now i would be able to slog for about 12 hours 14 hours so on and so forth so right now i have the energy to put in my efforts and to get the finances as well but after a particular period of time let's say after 60 years you do not have the same amount of energy and the same amount of vitality and you would not be able to contribute the same way so who has to take care of it it is the pension funds because you would not be getting a salary because you would not be working for a particular company or for an organization so at this juncture what you require is the pension so the pension happens to be a social security bracket then we also have the health insurance we also also have disability insurance we also have other types of insurance like the old age insurance all these is what is provided as part of the social security net so what is social security basically it is that particular financial independence that is given to an individual once a person retires from that particular profile it is the health insurance that is provided to an individual it is the social insurance that is provided to an individual it is the insurance that is provided on the disability it is the insurance that is provided when a person meets with an accident and is no more able to take care of himself as well as his family it is an insurance that is provided at an old age or when a person meets disability so all under the bracket of social security so what is the author trying to convey from this article the author currently goes on to say that yes we do have the social security schemes and programs but it has to be revamped at a larger level primarily because there are issues that are existing in the social security schemes and programs so the author says for the past few years the government has been coming up with couple of programs and these programs one there are couple of issues one there has to be a reach because many people don't know about it second is with respect to the budget one they do not know about these particular schemes and programs second is with respect to the budget allocation one we've been making budget allocation this budget allocation is comparatively less and even if the budget allocation has been made many people do not know about it they have no idea about it and how will they seek the social security benefits from the government they have no idea about it and ultimately what we also see is couple of cesses have been imposed it is staying idle and this is where there has to be a revamp with respect to the social security schemes and programs says the author so thirdly what we have is called as the gig economy it is the gig economy and its workers who have not been taken into confidence is what is this article in a brief gist so let us try and understand what the author is trying to say with the help of some data as well as with the help of some analysis around 53 percent of all the salaried workforce does not have any se social security benefits in india according to the periodic labor force survey annual report of 2021-22 another conclusion is that 1.9 percent of the poorest 20 percent quintile of india's workforce has access to has access to any benefits meanwhile gig workers or approximately 1.3 percent of india's active labor force rarely have any access to any social security benefit india's social security system is also ranked poorly in the mercer cm cfs rank it at 40 out of the 43 countries so these numbers clearly predict and clearly emphasize and rethrow a very bleak picture when it comes to the social security the social security is what you can think about yourself for the near future it is a concurrent plan for the next few years which you would not be able to invest a lot of energy into the system so at that particular moment what you require is an alternative where you have finances coming by for you 
but this is not taken into consideration says this article so article says around 53% of all salaried workforce does not have any social security benefits in the country so the article goes on to say that we can make use of couple of models we can make use of changes that has to be introduced so what does the author say in the financial year 2011 the national social security fund was set up for an unorganized sector workers with an initial allocation of 1000 crores to support schemes for the weavers rickshaw pullers and bd workers to name a few the amount was a pittance when compared to the requirement of over 22841 crore as estimated by the center for budget and governance accountability a comptroller and auditor general of india audit on the scheme in financial year 17 identified that 1927 crore was accumulated and was yet not utilized for these funds contribution per to the by the center to old age pension schemes have stagnated at 200 a month since 2006 below the minimum wage per day this clearly enunciates that we are not able to revamp the social security program the budget allocation that we have for this particular program continues to stay as it is and even the budgetary allocation has not been improving over a period of time what happens let's say a budgetary allocation has been made in 2010 this has to change with the inflation in the market 2010 there would have been a particular rate of inflation 2015 what we would have seen is a rise of the inflation 2020 for the rise of the inflation so as the inflation changes over a period of time what we also have to do is increase the amount of budgeting that goes to a particular social security program but this has not been changed by the government this is where the author goes on to say the old age pension scheme has stagnated at 200 a month is 200 a month enough for a person who is working in who staying let's say in bangalore or in delhi or in mumbai or in chennai nay or in hyderabad no this is not at all enough because this 200 is even below the minimum wage and that is not enough says the author in fact sexes have been imposed these sexes have not been effectively imposed these sexes that have been imposed are not effectively used they are laying in the coffers of the government and have not been effectively used whenever a cess is imposed by the government the amount of cess that is imposed by the government and the money that is collected in the coffers of the government can only be made used by the government for that particular program let's say for example the government has imposed a cess for the education development of the primary education so if the government has imposed a cess for that particular program and the money is collected let's say about 100 crores can the government use this 100 crores for building of roads no can the government use this 100 crores for construction of sewage projects no can the government use this 100 crores for any other program no if a cess has been imposed by the government it can only be used for that particular program this is also important from your preliminary examination point of view so the point is the government has imposed the cess for the social security program so on and so forth but then this amount is laying in the coffers of the government and is yet not being implemented that's the major problem and added to it over a period of time the mandrega which is supposed to get the funding has also been reduced and this is going to significantly impact the social security says the author so the author in this background brings an example from the international expertise where the author says that we can make use of the brazil model brazil currently has what is called as the general social security scheme which is contribution based substituting income loss for a worker and his family whether in partial or full what is it there is a program this program is called as the general social security scheme where a certain amount of contribution will have to be paid by that person who wants a social security if i want the social security let's say i am earning about 1000 rupees i am contributing a certain percentage of this amount that i have earned to this fund so that in case there is an exigency an emergency or some uncalled incident a contribution will be made by the government and the same would be given back to the person this covers any situation due to an accident at work a disability that prevents worker from working death 
illness medical treatment that leads to time away from work family burdens or the prospect of unemployment in all these cases funding or the salary or the money would be provided by the government even income loss that occurs due to a worker being imprisoned so let's say he is imprisoned he is committed an illegal offense he is thrown behind bars so if there is a contribution that is made even during that period this person's family would be getting a certain amount of money unemployment insurance is paid from worker support funds and healthcare is covered through the united health system the constitution of brazil itself has established that if there is a lack of funds the national treasury will step in immediately the social security benefits can be availed of with a simple phone call or with a visit to a bank with no requirement to submit endless documents as highlighted in brazilian good practices in social security so the point that the author is also trying to emphasize is the fact that we have too many papers we have to give too many documents to the government of india and the respective authorities even after giving these papers we are not sure whether we will be getting that particular social benefit or not because there is a lot of red tape there is a lot of corruption there is red tape that is involved which is actually wanting some bribe for that particular case so in order to eliminate all this what you require is transparency in the system and if this can be completely digitized if all that i have to do is the set of documents that are given on the website for that program and immediately after this program which is notarized or this is authenticated by one of the authorities i upload it on the digital platform so the minute this platform is upload i mean i'm documented are uploaded on the platform there should be no hindrance whatsoever and everything should happen digitally we are moving towards this digital revolution but this has to be expedited this has has to be as soon as possible so that this brazilian good practices can also be taken into picture if there is physical presence that is required then maybe they can go there and get these photographs done sign there and come back but the enough number of documents that this document is not proper that document is not proper more documents has to be given so this is an excuse for getting the bribe from that person so this has to be avoided and a digital revolution will have to take forward this idea is the intention of the author so the author further goes on to say that in the next few years what we will have is an aging indian population more number of people will enter this fold of not working so they will require the social security benefits in fact the government of india also introduced code on social security for the social security to be brought in for all sections of the people but is it for all sections of the people really no so the author says this is mostly covering the formal sector and not the informal sector who are the formal and the informal sector if a person is a salaried person if he is getting a salary on a fixed premise on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis so there is a structure that is there an employer employee relationship is established that is the formal sector so the code of social security charity which includes the pf that is the provident fund so on and so forth is all covered but what about the informal sector people who do not have a fixed source of income people who are actually working in the informal sector where they do not have a fixed source of income there is no employer backing them this also has to be covered as part of the social security code says the author so what are the measures that have to be taken the employees provident fund organization this has to be expanded more funding has to be coming up from the provident fund organization as of now when it comes to the informal sector a partial contribution can also be done as of now when you look at the informal sector what is being currently being projected is that this is voluntary only a person who wants to do it should do it other person should not be forced into it why not after a particular period of time it is the money that they have contributed which will be coming back to them so the informal sector people who are working in the informal sector even for them a partial contributions will have to be made so if i am a person who is working in the informal sector let's say i am earning about 1000 a month or 2000 a month compulsorily a certain amount of money will have to go from my account to this fund and ultimately this will come back to me when i grow old so an informal sector 
partial contributions can be elicited and this can also be made mandatory as of now we are seeking for an involuntary contributions i mean a uh, voluntary contributions but this has to be made mandatory this has to be made compulsory and at the same time all those people who are unemployed these people the government will have to take care so there are three people whom it is considering one is for those who are in the formal sector the one who are in the informal sector and those who are unemployed for the ones who are in the formal sector who are already employed expand the basis on the foundations of the provident fund for the informal sector if it is possible make it mandatory and not voluntary and for those who have no kind of job who do not hold any job for them the government should step in and a amount has to be contributed we have the eshram portal this eshram portal currently puts a lot of burden on the registration on the informal work this has to be taken care of and this has to be simplified as well we have to also move beyond the construction and the gig workers who are the gig workers let's say for example a person who is working in swiggy or zomato what does he do in case you're ordering your food he goes to a restaurant he picks up your order your food item and ultimately delivers it to you so those people who are not permanent workers who work on a daily basis they don't know whether they'll be employed tomorrow or not if they are working for a company on a daily basis and they are earning and making their wages such are called as the gig workers for a person who is working in let's say swiggy who delivers the food or zomato or an amazon delivery boy these people do not have a fixed source of income or they may not be person who are part of the permanent membership of that company so as of now most of the social security code is only focusing on the construction workers gig workers even as part of the code of the social security but they have to go beyond it is another suggestion made by the author the author also takes into picture the flight of the domestic workers let's say for example most of the domestic workers who are working happens to be the women a woman would not know whether she has the work tomorrow or not because she is working in a profile where she does not know whether there will be people who will be employing her for next subsequent number of days so even these domestic workers will have to be covered as part of the social security then we have the migratory workers who move from one place to another these people will have to be covered under the social security scheme then we have to strengthen the existing scheme then there is overlapping areas of authority between the state and the center and they also have confusing definitions what do we understand by this when it comes to the labor issues it is a concurrent matter this can also be very important from your preliminary examination point of view so we have the state government which has its own share of laws we have the central government which also has its own share of laws what if there is a conflict between the central and the state laws and what if there is overlapping jurisdiction and there are definitional changes as well so one government says that this is what is the right definition the other government says there is a different perspective about the definition of informal sector so there is a confusion a dilemma a complex and a paradigm that is created which is perplexing in nature at this moment what we have to do is simplify this entire process remove this archaic clause that are in place contradicting provisions and ultimately make sure that these people are into the social security bracket so the migratory workers who move from one state to another so the central government has one law state government has another laws there is one authoritative body which says one thing the other authoritative body which says another thing how am i going to reform this bring a structural change with respect to these laws and ultimately raise awareness about the social security people do not know the importance of social security today i have the money today i have the finances today i have the monetary advantages i go about spending it relentlessly not thinking of the future so a certain contribution of money from my salary or from the earnings that i do should be going for the future this awareness has to be given to the people so the author says if we are able to bring these changes introduce these changes government brings a major structural reform what we will have is a social security net which will be covered and this is what is going to create a prosperous society as of now we have the youth population we have the demographic dividend people who are within an age group where they will be able to put in their efforts but after a period of time what we will have is an aging population these aging population people will have to be taken into picture says the author 
what are the existing programs that we have as part of the social security we have the pradhan mantri shram yogi mandan yojana we have pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti yojana we have pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana ayushman bharat pradhan mantri jan aarogya yojana which is the health insurance then we have pradhan mantri suraksha bima yojana which happens to cover the accidental death then what we have is the pradhan mantri jeevan jyoti yojana which is the life insurance and these are already in place apart from this which are the other social security schemes which i have not covered here which you feel is present and is undertaken by the government of india please put it on the comment section so these are some of the programs that have been taken by the government of india and this should ultimately help in addressing the social security and providing social justice to the people in our country is what is this article all about now let's look into the next article this article says india welcomes consensus based approach to expand brics says the prime minister of our country first let us understand a brief idea about brics then we will understand that brics is opening up to large number of countries and the idea that is being propagated is that this brics as an organization stands for the global south then we will take up arguments about why this may not be successful then we will also compare brics with the non aligned movement and we will see what is the way forward when it comes to brics how did it all start in 2001 british economist jim o'neil of goldman sachs joined coined the term brick standing for the initials of what he said were the four emerging economies at that moment which stands for brazil russia india and china why did he choose brick that is because it is like the bricks b r i c k s which is able to build a construction which is able to mold itself so these countries will be able to mold themselves and they will be the future power holders was the initial perception this brick went on to become brics by the adding up of south africa now brics includes five economies <coughs> representing 42% of the world's population 30% of the world's territory 23% of the global gdp around 80% of the 18% of the world trade according to its website an informal meeting of the grouping was held in 2006 among russia india china on the sidelines of g8 outreach summit in russia and the first formal meeting was in 2009 also in russia South Africa joined in 2010 expanding it to BRICS so where was the first BRIC meeting can be a point of for your preliminary examination when was South Africa added to BRICS and became BRIC to BRICS can be a point of your BRIC preliminary examination now that we have understood the introduction why did BRICS come into picture we did discuss recently in our Uh, discussion on our daily current affairs discussion that brics as a platform was created because of the west it was the west which helped these countries come together and create this platform called as brics why that is because when you look at couple of world organizations that we have today for example we have the united nations security council or we have the international monetary fund or we say united nations most of it is dominated by the western powers they were not giving voice to the eastern powers or to the global south countries which are these global south countries when we consider the differentiation we have the global north we also have the global south global north by an ideology it's not an ideology per se it is on the economic development so all those countries which have had well advanced economic conditions were called as global north all those countries which were developing which is wanting to develop were called as the global south so the international forums that we have were only listening to the voice of the global north the developed countries the western powers but they did not pay heed to the voices of the global south so in order to give voice to the global south this very premise or the brics was created added to it let's go back to the year 1990 what happened in 1990 there was balkanization of the soviet union 
Prior to 1990, we had two superpowers. One was United States of America. It had its own ideology. Then we had the Soviet Union. It had its own ideology. So countries were either part of these two ideologies. If they were not part of these two ideologies, they also had their own ways of addressing the global issues in the form of the non-aligned movement. Let's take this non-aligned movement a bit later. But as of now, countries were part of either these. United States of America or the Soviet Union. But 1919, something else happened. There was balkanization of the Soviet Union, which means to say there was disintegration of the Soviet Union and many countries came out of Soviet Union and Soviet Union itself became Russia. So the only power that we had was United States of America. Russia, which was the major part of Soviet Union, was not able to impose the same amount of power and the only superpower that retained our after 1990 was the United States of America. Then something else was happening in 1990s. What we had was another power which also wanted to, to be as equal as United States of America was China. But China did not have many of the supporters. Russia also did not have supporters. So these two countries came together. These two countries came together and they also wanted to overthrow the power and the hegemony and the dominance of United States of America as a only superpower. So what exactly happens? You have the only superpower in the form of United States of America. This had to be dethroned. And when you dethrone this power, all you will have is another power. So moving from a unique polar world to a multipolar world. So they wanted a group of countries which support this particular ideology that there will not be a unipolar world, that there will be a multipolar world. So an organization, a platform, a, an avenue to voice out this concern was BRICS. So BRICS became the voice of the global south. BRICS became the voice of the so-called anti-West in this particular picture. So this article currently goes on to say, with this as the backdrop, BRICS countries, that is five countries came together. But now we have the summit that is taking place in South Africa. And at the same time, there are a large number of countries which also want to become part of this initiative, which means to say that there'll be more number of countries which may join in the near future as part of the BRICS. But is it going to be helpful? No, says couple of articles and a perception. Why? Because even if many countries are becoming part of BRICS, it is just the numbers, but it is not going to be a successful affair, says the author. What are the points given by couple of authors in this particular case? We have to focus on Russia and China. One, when it comes to Russia and China, what they are trying to project is an anti-West stand. So all those countries which are part of, let's say, not liked by United States, I mean, they do not like United States of America, they do not like the Western powers. It is such countries which are falling and coming into the ambit of this BRICS. And at the same time, there are people who are also linking this BRICS to the non-aligned movement. So the question is, is non-aligned movement and BRICS similar? Because what BRICS was, is able to do right now is throw up against the Western powers. Is it equivalent to the non-aligned movement? No, it is not equivalent to the non-aligned movement. When it comes to the non-aligned movement, what was happening? You had United States of America on one side, you had Soviet Union on one side. Countries were tilted towards all these sides. That is when the intellectual beauty of Nehruji comes into picture. He says that we we are a countries or a group of countries which are not going to fall back to United States of America or to the Soviet Union. We do not have an ideology. We do not have any kind of an alignment, alignment in terms of United States of America, alignment in terms of Soviet Union. So we are all those countries which are coming together, embracing ourselves, increasing the bond hummy, and we are non-aligned. We are non-aligned to any of these ideologies. But what is happening in BRICS currently? BRICS is currently propagating a particular idea which is against the West. So is non-aligned movement similar to that of the BRICS? No. BRICS has an ideology which says that we are against the Western powers but non-aligned movement is not against any of the countries. We are saying that we are not aligned to United States of America. We are not aligning with the Soviet Union. We are independent as per the time, as per the need, 
as per the urgency, as per the exigencies of the time, we will take a benefits from United States of America. We will take benefits from the Soviet Union. We will take benefits and we will also not be part of any of the ideology was the objective of non-aligned movement. But when it comes to the BRICS, it is not the same. It is an anti-West posturing issue. So the BRICS may not be equivalent to non-aligned movement. Non-aligned movement had an its own objective. But when it comes to BRICS, it is not the same, says Raj Mohan sir, who happens to be one of the international relations expert. So the idea that is being propagated that many countries will fall within the ambit of BRICS. So it is going to be a new non-aligned movement. No, it's not going to be that easy, says the author. So basically comparing non-aligned movement with that of BRICS is not going to help serve the purpose and added to it, what we will also have is conflicting viewpoints. Let's say, for example, when it comes to countries, let's say we have the SARC. What happens in SARC? When it comes to SARC, we have India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan do not have good relationship. So what's happening within SARC is that India takes up an initiative. This will be opposed by Pakistan. Now let's go to SEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What happens in that? We have India and China, which does not have good relationship. We have India and Pakistan, which does not have good relationship. If more number of countries come to a particular organization, let's say like BRICS, there'll be more misunderstandings that could happen. SARC is not a good organization according to stats because there is rivalry of India and Pakistan. SEO, there is rivalry of India and China and India and Pakistan. So when more countries come, you have to meet the exigencies and meet the viewpoints of couple of countries. So there will be no consensus that is built. If more countries come into the picture, the consensus will not be developed and they will not be able to reach to a particular outcome and that is another major issue says the author so we are happy that more number of countries are coming into the bracket and the ambit of the BRICS but it's not gonna serve the purpose why because there will be conflicting viewpoints different opinions how are you going to mold and build a consensus of these different opinions is another major concern. So if we are able to address it, which we will not be able to address, and that is another major issue with respect to BRICS, says the author. So is BRICS going to be a very successful one if more number of countries come into its ambit? Not necessary, but we have to wait and watch, says the author. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this article. Now let's look into this article. This article says ethical perspectives with respect to artificial intelligence. So this article says that we have couple of advances when it comes to artificial intelligence. Let's say meteorology or let's say computing or let's say we have to do with agriculture or let's say scientific technologies or let's say even to do with human body as well what we are making use of the artificial intelligence and artificial technology which is able to mold a particular idea create solutions to a problem yes all this is happening but can we look at the ethical side of it can the AI or the artificial intelligence form understand the emotions of a human being? Can it understand the value system of a human being? All that the artificial intelligence does is there is a rule book that is prescribed by the programmer. These rule books and the ideas and the prescriptions are followed by the artificial intelligence. But what about the emotions that go by? Let me give you an example and help you understand this. We have what is called as the law. What is the law? A law is a tool to provide justice. A law is something which has been described by the representatives, the legislature come up and define a law. Then we have something called as the truth. What is truth? Truth is a fact. Truth is what is right. But is law and truth the same? No. Truth might be a fact. Law is the bare act that is written by the legislature. So when a person goes before the judiciary, law is given importance and not truth. What is truth here? Let me give you a simple of example. Let's say I am a person who I have given a check to another person and this check is valued about 10 lakhs. So this person has taken credit. So I have given this check 
blank check blank check to another person now this person has given me a credit of let's say 10 lakh so i will say this person i'm giving you this 10 lakh so after a considerable period of time you put it in the bank and this you can take the money from the bank but this person forgets it and let's say he puts it into the bank let's say after three years we have the limitation act the limitation act says that if a person is given a loan this person should have given the check within a period of three years three years is the limitation period what if a person drops this check after three years will he be getting the amount in few parameters and few cases it says no why because it is barred by limitation so what is law law says that within three years if you have to make a loan recovery you have to file a case in the court of law that is the law but what is the truth truth is that this person has given the money but law is disabling this person from taking the money so is it right no there are issues within it so law is right but when it comes to the truth it may not be right so law is a tool but justice is the end point so law may give a particular parameter but it may not be necessarily truth as well let me give you another instance let's say for example we have online dispute resolution what is this online dispute resolution online dispute resolution basically will bring all parameters of the legal system onto the online platform so you would have a computer you would have an individual let's say there is one party one there is also a party two as well so the party one in this particular case he will put out his viewpoints so the party two who happens to be another person will also put out this point so there is the computer which is staying in center that is the technology the artificial intelligence tool which is able to look at the facts of party one facts of party two and ultimately it will give out a judgment saying that so and so is the incident and so and so is the compensation and the damages that have to be paid but will it actually serve the purpose yes in most of the cases or it may not even serve but there is something called as the emotional side to it this emotional side may not be considered by the artificial intelligence so is it ethical for the artificial intelligence to only consider the facts and not the emotions going by it so whenever there is a case there are emotions that go by it as well there are facts and circumstances of the case as to why that particular incident happened this may not be taken up by the artificial intelligence tools all that the artificial intelligence tool does is it goes by the rules it goes by the laws it goes by the algorithms that is fed into the system but what about the emotions that a person might have gone through a person might hit another person but then why that particular incident happened only the human beings will know only the human beings will understand what is the premise what is happening internally and the thought process through the advocacy skills when he is able to speak up and all that but the artificial intelligence tools will not understand it so if we are bringing artificial intelligence to such areas will it be ethical is the question that is being asked by the author so there are a couple of other areas as well this is one such example that i have given you that is the online dispute resolution where parties come up and give their statements and then this is ultimately taken into the form of uh, a bullet points and this bullet points will look into the laws it look into the precedents and ultimately deliver the precedents but what about the emotions so if emotions are not taken into picture is it really ethical is the argument made by the author so when artificial intelligence does not take into picture the ethical premise that will not serve the purpose says the author now let's look into the next article this article here is speaking about astra what is astra it happens to be an air to air missile this is very important from the preliminary examination point of view it is a state of art air to air missile to engage and destroy highly maneuvering supersonic aerial targets design and development DR drdl research center emirate and other laboratories of drdo important point for prelims it is 3.6 meters long with a diameter of 178 mm and weighs 154 kg it uses mid course initial guidance given by fiber optic gyroscope with terminal guidance and active radar homing 
it is equipped with electronic counter and counter measures to allow operation even during enemy attempts to jam the seeker using electronic counter measures it carries a 15 kg high explosive pre fragmented warhead activated by a proximity fuse this happens to be a air to air missile so this missile will be attached to the aircraft let's say for example tejas or we have any other aircraft that is there and once it is attached to the aircraft the aircraft would be able to open this up and this happens to be an air to air missile so if there is a fight that happens between one jet and another jet enemy jet this will release the astra and it will able to go and hit that particular target so what are the advantages one this is an indigenous program we don't have to import it from another country we are saving a lot on the money front we will not be paying this money to an external agency or a country and at the same time we know the whereabouts of this apparatus entirely and what we will have is atmanirbharata or the indigenization it is this that we have to understand with respect to this article so this is it for today if you are liking these initiatives please to like subscribe and share it with your fellow aspirants thank you for watching all the best